Today's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Some parts might be familiar, other parts may be new to you, but it reads like this. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, there's always going to be temptation to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It will be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. If there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day each time, turns to you and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. And so the Lord answered, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to the mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and plant yourself in the sea and it would obey you. Well, this past week, our area was hit with a pretty big snowstorm for our region, and it was a dream come true for my five-year-old son. This was the second time that he had ever encountered snow and the second time that he really went sledding, but the first time I don't count so much because that time the temperature was not even above freezing when we went outside. And by the end of our sledding session, it was rain rather than snow, and it was just a kind of a slushy mess. But this time, this week, it was a different story. And he had to layer up with more clothes than he had ever worn before. He looked like Chandler from that one Friends episode where he put on all of the clothes. You know what I'm talking about, right? Because the wind was blowing and the temperature was in the teens and so he needed to add layer upon layer. And while he wasn't such a big fan of it while we were inside, the good news is that when he fell off of his sled, uh, you know, after a successful run, he would just kind of lay there looking up at the sky or sometimes even face first. And he kind of looked like a turtle on a shell and uh, could barely get up. But then when his sisters would come and hit him with a snowball, he would always shout, you missed me, you missed me, because he couldn't feel them. He had so many layers on, the impact wasn't felt. And that's the image that I want to bring with us. All of these layers impact you know, so that we can't feel those impacts. I want to bring that imagery as we continue our teaching series, The Grudge, this week as we discuss forgiveness. Because see, when we insulate ourselves with layer upon layer of callous or jadedness or mistrust or distance from harm that, is, that can be done to us, we can repel a whole lot of stuff just like that winter jacket can make the snowball go unnoticed. However, it can also be a really lonely and isolating place to be you know, walking around feeling like some kind of stay puffed marshmallow man because we have so many layers of jadedness and conceit that are just unseen by others, but our hearts are so hard. And when we remove those layers, when we're willing to be vulnerable enough to take off those layers, we see something truly amazing. We see who we are in the eyes of God, and we get to live the life that we're called to be. After all, God isn't asking us to forgive to heal the other person. We're called to forgive to heal ourselves. And last week, we were reminded that our lives are too short and our calling is too great to let the little stuff derail our lives. And so you were encouraged to short circuit that anger and resentment by tending to the gap of harm and our reaction, filling that in, filling that space between with love and humility, because then we can live a more freeing life. But that's the little stuff. What about the big stuff, right? The little things may be easy to let go of or address in just a, a glance or a passing conversation, but there is big hurt too that we just can't let go of. If we try just to let go of the big stuff without working through it, we cheapen the forgiveness that we offer, or we don't fully acknowledge the hurt that has been done to us, and sometimes we need to sit with that hurt before we can actually recognize the depth of the, the forgiveness that we are offering up. But before we go any further, I want to remind you that the most important part of this message is that harm comes in all shapes and sizes. There's no one-size-fits-all solution for forgiveness. And so as we talk today, I want to offer up some guidelines or things to consider, but I would encourage you, I would encourage you, I am not a mental health professional, and so I would encourage you to talk about your particular situation with a pastor, friend, mental health professional uh, in a way that is safe and that can lead to life-giving purpose. 
And so while we discuss the power of working through our forgiveness of these big things in your life, please recognize that forgiveness and reconciliation are not linear. They're not a straight line, like up and to the right or up and to the left or whatever. Like it's often messy, similar to grief. And so that being said, forgiveness is worth the work. Forgiveness lets us know the cost of what God has done for us in our spiritual life. Like it, it perseveres or it preserves important relationships that liberate us from past hurts as well. Forgiveness is letting, the, you know, letting go of that right to retribution. And I know that it's hard to fully forgive because when somebody has wronged us or someone has sinned against us, it hurts and likely puts layers between us and that person, adding another layer of clothing like we're going out for a snowball fight. We prepare, we get ready to have those interactions with those people that we have unresolved issues with. And so we layer up and we put on, we can't just be ourselves. Well, forgiveness removes some of those layers so that we can be more open in the relationship. Now, in the story of Scripture, God's grace is at the center. God lets go of that right to retribution for all, because all have committed sins against God. And so that forgiveness removes those layers between us and God, and that harm that is built up. That's what the church word atonement is all about. And now, whether we can forgive ourselves and accept this grace is a whole other message in actually a next session, or a couple of sessions. Anyway, but... But that's what forgiveness is, letting go of that right for retribution. And the more that we can forgive and work through the forgiveness process, the more we understand God's forgiveness for us. The more fully that we can forgive, the more fully we tend to be able to accept forgiveness as well and move on. Like it's a healthy thing, even though it's really hard. Forgiveness also preserves important relationships. The biblical call to forgive 70 times seven is a call to preserve important relationships. Remember, Jesus would have been talking to the disciples and a small group of followers that made up this early church when we had this message that we came from from uh, the Gospel of Luke. And as a community, there is power in knowing that we are all working to bring about the kingdom of God together we can fully utilize our gifts and graces when we know that others are gonna extend us the same grace that we are called to extend to them. Last week, we touched on a little bit of that unity call together. But for this, let's now look at the pattern of forgiveness that our scripture calls us to. First and foremost, in, in that passage, it calls us to rebuke the person, then observe repentance, and then offer that for, or, or forgive the other person. This process is simple, but it's in, by no means easy. The rebuke is to tell someone, tell that other person the hurt or the harm that they have caused you. First, if it's safe, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. That's how this works. We wanna keep the, the, the conversation and the confrontation small at the beginning to preserve all of that integrity, right? And so try to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, again, if, it's viable. Even if it's not, take a third party to help with that conversation. Matthew 18, 5 through 20 outlines how we can address offenses or breaking of the covenant in small as the smallest group possible so that that integrity of the person who's causing the harm may be maintained. And they respect that you're coming to them directly or with another person so that it doesn't become this whole big thing. Don't let your first step in kind of announcing or rebuking the person, the biblical language, happen on some kind of public forum or, you know, on a Facebook group where there's a feud between neighbors and they're barking dogs and all of that, that, that just puts the person who is in the wrong on the defensive and nobody's a winner, right? There's little reconciliation to be had when barking dogs, both the dog and the neighbors, come at each other online. And so then we recognize that the second step of our forgiveness process, after we name and, and address that harm that's been done to us, is that our scripture mentions that we need to observe repentance. A change in attitude or action indicates the progress being made. This helps everyone grow and prevents the same thing from happening repeatedly. If the wrong that has been done to you is something that you have been carrying around with for a while, it has the potential to create a lasting scar. But you need to make sure that you can live with those words of forgiveness that you're offering. And therefore, when you're asked to forgive, it's a good and right thing to take some time to look 
for repentance or a change of heart from that person. You don't have to hand wave away an offense or offer forgiveness in less time than it takes to put an order in through a drive through especially if the relationship's an important one that you want to preserve. It's worth taking the time, building up trust, and allowing something to happen that's not just rushed because you feel like you have to. Remember when you were little and parents made you say sorry even though you weren't and stuff like that, right? Same concept. Let's make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a bad situation because we're rushing just to say the words. And so after we observe forgive, or after we observe repentance, finally we forgive. We remove the impediments between us and that other person. We take off those layers. We don't just forget though, right? Because forgiveness has happened. It doesn't mean that things don't change. Boundaries must be established and trust rebuilt because this leads to a more uh, full growth and healing of that relationship. We don't forget because that's the beauty of forgiveness that we can work through and that we can set aside that right to retribution so that our relationships can be more diverse and empowering. Forgiveness allows us to understand God's character more fully and it preserves important relationships. It also liberates us from the past hurts that we've had. There are times when the people or person who have hurt us will not repent and we can't change that. We can only can ch change who we are and decide what our next step is. They won't work towards reconciliation or the trauma that they've caused, and it doesn't allow for a relationship there. But forgiveness is something that we can still choose to do. We can still choose to forgive them. Someone may have caused you harm and put a layer of clothing and insulating between you from getting hurt again. But it can also then prevent you from getting to know and getting close to others, not just the person that's harmed you. And so sometimes we work through the process of asking for forgiveness and forgiving so that we might be open to, uh, to new relationships in the future. Because when we hold on to the past resentment, negativity happens. The, the Journal of Behavioral Medicine found that people who forgive conditionally, as in, I'll forgive you a little bit or I'll forgive with strings attached, live shorter lives more unhappy lives, and more indicators of stress and anxiety throughout their whole body as a result of not letting go. Man, that's reason enough to want to forgive, right? The bottom line is, is that it, while this might not be very pastoral, I guess, it's the real, reality that I'm a human too. So anyway, take it for what it's worth. But there are people in my life that I'm working to forgive because I don't want them to have any more power over my future relationships or how I treat others. I want to be liberated from those people and those past hurts because I want to be the person that God has called me to be. I know that I'm a work in progress and I don't want the jerks to have the jerks of my past to make me a jerk today or tomorrow. I love there's this quote from Robin Kazarn who says, forgiveness is a favor that we do to ourselves. The core power of forgiveness is it returns to us the power to be happy. Friends, as we wrap up today, I wanna to remind you that the mission of this church is to equip and empower you to live lives of hope and connection in the name of Jesus. Through the practice of forgiveness, we can more fully understand the depth of God's love and grace preserve important relationships, and reclaim a future hope from past hurts. Remember that forgiving others is what God gave, called you to do because it's not our job to forgive others so that they might be healed, but so that we might be healed. And so may you go from this place working on forgiving others to liberate yourself from past hurts so we can step into a future of hope and connection. Amen.